Hello, and thank you for joining us for episode 59 of the Aviation News Talk podcast, where we bring you general aviation news and facts and tips that pilots like you can actually use. Today, we're talking about some recent fatal accidents in Northern California and how some of them fit into the national pattern of accidents here in the U.S., and some don't. Now, some of the common themes are that some of these planes were on long trips, others encountered weather, some were flying at night, and of course, that number one accident type here in the U.S., loss of control. And we'll also be sharing listener feedback and answering some listener questions. Plus, coming up in the news, we'll talk about the various twists and turns regarding ATC privatization that occurred in Washington, D.C. last week regarding an FAA reauthorization bill in the House. Plus, there's a big change that took effect on April 24th, and it affects everyone planning to take the commercial single engine or the initial CFI checkride. Also, there were multiple major announcements at the Aero Expo 2018 show in Friedrichshafen, Germany last week that we'll talk about. And finally, one well-known aviation organization has embarked on a listening tour, and we'll tell you what they're listening for. Welcome to Aviation News Talk, where we talk about general aviation. I'm Max Trescott. I'm here to educate and inform you as a pilot or student pilot by sharing my over 40 years of experience as a licensed pilot, author of the G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook, and the 2008 National Flight Instructor of the Year. I'm also a specialist in Cirrus aircraft like the SR-20 and SR-22. Last week in episode 58, we talked with CFI and lawyer John Farrell about how flight instructors can reduce their liability and some of the many things he mentioned apply to aircraft owners too. So if you missed that episode, you may want to check it out. Of course, this week we're going to talk about recent fatal accidents. All this and more on the news starts now. From flyingmagazine.com, Schuster backs down on ATC privatization plan. Well, first it was on and then it was off. A lot happened last week. On Tuesday, we learned that there were over 200 amendments proposed to House Bill H.R. 4, which was the FAA reauthorization bill. And among those amendments was a proposal from Representative Bill Schuster to privatize ATC. Well, GA groups put out an urgent call for their members to contact Congress to oppose the plan ahead of a vote, and general aviation pilots flooded Washington with emails and phone calls late on Tuesday to voice their displeasure. Well, later in the week, forced to back down from what he called just a modest reform, Schuster instead agreed to significantly revise the language, leaving only a measure that would create a chief technology officer position to work with the FAA's COO on ATC management. So while they didn't get ATC privatization into the bill, they did get one little finger still into the pie there. So we're going to have to watch that as it evolves in the future. And there was another interesting amendment as well from Representative Bill Schuster. This also from flyingmagazine.com. Initially, there was going to be a proposal that would require pilots who work for net jets to retire at age 65, the same age as airline pilots. Instead, now net jet pilots will be forced to retire at age 70, a compromise plan that has the backing of their union, which is the Net Jets Association of Shared Aircraft Pilots. While the mandatory age 70 retirement age for certain Part 135 and Part 91K pilots doesn't specify net jets, the mandate would apply only to companies that perform at least 150,000 turbojet operations in a calendar year, in effect making the new rule apply only to net jets. The earlier proposal by Schuster included language that stipulated companies with 100,000 operations would be affected. Some NetJet pilots, as well as AARP, balked at this new mandatory retirement age, saying that they were arbitrary and unnecessary. NetJets, meanwhile, cheered the legislation as, quote, an important change to improve flight safety. NetJet says the bill has a one-year phase-in period and will affect about 70 pilots who are older than age 70. From AOPA.org, later in the week, the House passed this FAA reauthorization legislation in a 393 to 13 vote. This would provide funding for the FAA for the next five years. And as we've said, the bill did not include language for the removal of air traffic control, often referred to as ATC privatization. According to the article, Representative Sam Graves, chairman of the House General Aviation Caucus, supported a number of provisions in the bill, including extending the aircraft registration period from three years to 10 years and ensuring that aeronautical uses of a hangar include the construction of an aircraft in any stage. The bill also calls on the FAA to work with federal security agencies to recommend potential alternative security procedures to allow vetted pilots to fly during TFRs. This provision was spearheaded by representatives from Florida, where airports in their respective districts have been adversely affected by numerous TFRs associated with presidential travel. That's great news because that may provide some of the relief that we'd like to see for airports like Lantana, which have been all but shut down during presidential visits. 
Now, the Senate has its own FAA reauthorization bill, Senate Bill 1405, which is expected to be brought up for debate as early as May and may not include language to remove ATC from the FAA. And here's a story that I found on the safepilots.org website. That's the Professional Society for Flight Instructors. It says use of a complex airplane during commercial pilot or flight instructor practical test no longer required. Well, this has been talked about for probably at least five years. And in fact, Cirrus Aircraft went so far as to design a fake landing gear switch that could be mounted on the front panel so that pilots could simulate raising and lowering the landing gear at some of the large flight academies that thought they might someday be able to use the Cirrus for commercial check rides. Well, now even that's not going to be needed because commercial and CFI candidates are no longer required to provide a complex aircraft for their check rides. So the good news is that flight schools, they no longer longer have to keep around 40-year-old 172RGs or Arrows just for those check rides. Now, this is a real boon to Cirrus and other manufacturers who can now have their aircraft used for all single-engine check rides. Best of all, this took effect immediately upon release of the notice on April 24th. And I've gone ahead and posted the notice at the Patreon site at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, where you can read the full text. From AIN Online comes a follow-up to a story that we talked about in episode 57. And you may recall that the pilot of Cessna Citation CJ4 collided with a Cessna 150 on the runway at an intersection on April 2nd at Indiana's non-towered Marion Municipal Airport. Well, according to the NTSB, the CJ4 pilot didn't make a Unicom call before the collision, whereas two witnesses heard the Cessna 150 pilot on runway 15 on the Unicom frequency. The Cessna 150 was departing runway 15 when it struck the twin jet, which landed on runway 22. Both occupants of the piston single were killed, while the CJ-4 sustained substantial damage, the report said. Evidence at the intersection showed that the airplanes came together perpendicular to each other. Examination of the accident site showed the Cessna 150 had struck the empennage of the Cessna 525 at the intersection of runways 15 and 22. According to the NTSB, the CJ-4 pilot did not see the departing Cessna 150 while he was on a straight and approach to runway 22 or during the landing roll. The jet pilot did attempt to use onboard TCAS to scan for traffic on approach, the NTSB said, but the TCAS did not show any traffic on the airport. Well, no surprise if the aircraft was on the ground or was not equipped with a traffic system, he would not have been visible on a TCAS or any other type of traffic system. And all I can say, folks, is let's just try and follow all the rules all the time. We talked in a recent episode about a new advisory circular that was released by the FAA in March which says that when pilots are approaching a non-towered airport, they should make their first radio call 10 miles out from the airport. And in our update sections, I'll talk briefly about a pilot who made a very late call on Sunday at a non-towered airport and came way too close to me. From General Aviation News comes a story that GA pilots are struggling to interpret weather forecasts and displays. The story says, when tested on their knowledge of 23 types of weather information, 204 general aviation pilots surveyed by Embry-Riddle University were stumped by about 42% of the questions. The findings were published in the April 2018 edition of the International Journal of Aerospace Psychology, and they are worrisome because GA pilots flying smaller planes at lower altitudes, usually with minimal ground-based support, have higher weather-related accidents and fatality rates. Instrument-rated commercial pilots achieved the highest score with a 65% percent accuracy level. Instrument rated private pilots ranked second with 62 percent. Private pilots flying without an instrument rating scored 57 percent. And student pilots correctly answered only 48 percent of the questions. Thomas Gwynn, an associate professor of meteorology at Embry-Riddle and co-author of the study, noted that it's critical for pilots to assess big picture weather issues before takeoff. In addition, they need to understand, for instance, that radar displayed inside a cockpit shows what happened up to 15 minutes earlier. Quote, if you're flying 120 miles per hour and you don't understand that there's a lag time in ground-based radar data reaching your cockpit, that can be deadly, he said. A follow-up study involving about a thousand GA pilots across the United States is now underway. From avweb.com, Southwest Accident brings passenger safety briefings to the forefront. One of several safety-related issues that has emerged from the fatal engine failure on Southwest Flight 1380 is passenger response to safety briefings. Perhaps most striking in this incident is that in spite of the usual pre-flight rundown on the proper use of oxygen masks, video from the Southwest emergency shows several passengers with masks positioned over only their mouths. Given how much thought and money goes into creating safety videos and procedures, question now facing the industry is, why aren't they working better? And I just wanted to comment that even though I listen to lots of safety briefings 
on airliners, I'm not sure that in an emergency, I would have remembered to put the oxygen mask over both my mouth and my nose. So I'll certainly uh, remember that in the future. In international news, this comes from avweb.com, Canada recommends mandatory flight recorders for commercial and private business aircraft. The TSB, the Transportation Safety Board of Canada, is recommending mandatory installation of lightweight flight recording systems by all commercial and private business operators not currently required to carry them. The details are in the investigation report released last week into the 2016 fatal loss of control and collision with terrain of a Cessna Citation 500 in British Columbia. In that accident, the aircraft departed on a night IFR flight. However, shortly after takeoff, it entered a steep descending turn to the right until it struck the ground. No emergency call was made. All occupants were killed. Because there was no flight recording system on board the aircraft, the TSB could not determine the cause of the accident. The most plausible scenario is that the pilot, who was likely dealing with a high workload associated with flying the aircraft alone, experienced spatial disorientation and departed from controlled flight after takeoff. The investigation also determined that the pilot did not have the recent night flying experience required by the TSB for carrying passengers at night. Pilots without sufficient recent experience flying at night or by instruments are at greater risk of loss of control accidents. We don't like having to say we don't know when asked what caused an accident and why, said Kathy Fox, chair of the TSB. We want to be able to provide definitive answers to the victim's family, to Canada's aviation industry, to the Canadian public. That's why we're calling today for the mandatory installation of lightweight flight recording systems on commercial and private business aircraft not currently required to carry them. In other international news, this comes from flyer.co.uk, that's Flyer magazine. Siemens shows hybrid electric diesel test unit. Siemens E-Aircraft, the electric aircraft division of the German engineering giant, is showing its latest test aircraft, the Magnus E-Fusion, equipped with a hybrid diesel-electric propulsion system at Aero Friedrichshafen. The aircraft made its first flight last week at an airfield in Hungary, as revealed by Frank Anton, head of Siemens E-Aircraft unit on Twitter. The hybrid Magnus E-Fusion is equipped with a Siemens SP55D electric motor and a Fly Eco diesel engine to allow for silent takeoff and landing with an extended range. The Fly Eco engine is an 800cc three-cylinder Mercedes-Benz smart turbo diesel producing 80 horsepower. It drives a generator producing 55 kilowatts of electricity for the electric motor. The complete propulsion system, included a new generator, inverters, and control systems, has been developed by Siemens E-Aircraft and is expected to provide meaningful insights into the application of hybrid electric systems for aircraft during future operations. Also from Flying Magazine, ForeFlight to launch VFR navigation app in Europe. The ForeFlight mobile flight planning and navigation app is launching in Europe and will use Jeppesen's European VFR data. The JEP VFR data will be available within ForeFlight from this coming summer and covers more than 2,200 airports in 29 countries. Chart data will be rendered as an overlay on the ForeFlight mobile map with a pilot able to customize and filter the display to personal preferences. Jeppesen and ForeFlight formed an alliance last year to introduce Jeppesen's global IFR and route database and nav data, along with terrain and obstacle data for use with ForeFlight mobile. Jeppesen IFR data for Europe is already available within ForeFlight mobile. And finally, from AOPA.org, Listening Tour strives for flight training success. AOPA's You Can Fly team has launched a listening tour to gather flight school feedback about those big questions. The You Can Fly Flight Training Initiative is donor-funded effort to provide flight schools with the support they need to help their students complete flight training. With up to 80% of those who start flight training not finishing, finding ways to promote student pilot success can produce more pilots from the existing pool of trainees while helping to reverse the decline of the general aviation pilot population, said Keith West, AOPA Senior Director of Flight School Business Support. The listening tour launched on April 12th at AOPA's Flight School Social at the Sun and Fun event in Lakeland, Florida, and it will continue at air shows and events throughout the fall. The AOPA You Can Fly team also introduced a survey it will use throughout the listening tour to shape strategies to help flight schools deliver the best service. Now, I went online and took the survey, and it asked a number of questions about satisfaction with business software that's being used at flight schools, and also asked about what kind of training flight schools would be interested in. I'll go ahead and put a link to the survey in our show notes, and you'll also find it on our Patreon page at aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. Well, that's the news for this week. Coming up, the summary of recent accidents in Northern California and how they are the same and different from accidents in the rest of the United States. Plus, listener feedback and questions, including one listener who gives details on an incident of GPS jamming by the military, 
and another listener who felt sick on a discovery flight and wants to know what to do about it. Stick around. We'll be back right here on the Aviation News Talk podcast. Yeah, welcome back. This is our update section, and I want to mention that if you have any problems playing last week's episode 58, well, that's because I initially uploaded the wrong episode, but then I very quickly uh, afterwards reloaded the correct episode. And then for the first time ever, I uploaded a text message, didn't even really know for sure you could do that, explaining what I had done. But I got to say, most people aren't used to seeing text in their podcast players. So if you looked at it and wondered why you didn't hear any audio for it, that's why. Text explains that if you had trouble hearing episode 58, just make sure that your podcast player is playing some totally different episode, then delete the episode 58, and then re-download episode 58, and everything should be fine. Most of you probably didn't have a problem, but I did talk with a couple of people who uh, did. And by the way, if you listen to the Airplane Geeks podcast, in which I've been a co-host for nearly four years, we just celebrated episode 500, which is quite a milestone. Sadly, one of my co-hosts, Rob Mark, who's been with the show for most of its 10 years, announced that he's dropping out of the show. I miss him already, so we'll just have to make sure we get him on this show a little bit more often. And speaking of great journalists like Rob, who works at Flying Magazine, I was saddened to read over the weekend on Twitter that Richard Collins passed away on Sunday, April the 29th. Richard was really an icon in general aviation. He began writing for Flying Magazine in 1968 and became editor-in-chief in 1977. Then he moved to AOPA Pilot Magazine as publisher and editor in 1988. And in 1993, he returned back to Flying Magazine as an editor-at-large, where he wrote a monthly column as well as some occasional feature articles. In October 2008, he retired as a regular contributor to Flying Magazine, and at the time of his retirement, he had spent 50 years on the masthead for aviation magazines. He then started running for AirfaxJournal.com, and I went over there to see what his last post was. It was dated just five weeks ago, and it was called Teaching Flying Over the Years Part 2, Dealing with the Students. And he said, quote, when someone would come to me to learn to fly, the first question I would ask is why they wanted to take up flying. You want to guess what response I liked best? Because I always thought I wanted to fly. Well, that was my hands-down favorite. Folks who came to flying with that thought in mind were always the best, the easiest students. He said, there was one answer I never got, but it was easily perceived after a short time with a student. I wanted to prove something. I always thought that was a terrible reason to do anything. And I found that students with that attitude tried so hard that they got tied up in a knot and couldn't prove anything. Well, personally, I first started reading Dick's articles back in the pages of Flying Magazine as a teenager back in the early 1970s. And I remember that he owned a Cessna P210 for many years and always wrote in detail about the weather on each of the many trips he took in the airplane. And I learned a lot from him. Later in life, he worked hard to avoid some of the kinds of weather he'd flown in before. And one of my favorite quotes from him in those later years was that he now flight plans by connecting the H's on a weather map. In other words, he flew from one high pressure area to another where there was likely to be the best weather. And I think of that often as I plan my own long cross-country trips these days. Dick also authored many, many, many books. He's absolutely a, a legend in our industry. He's going to be sorely missed. Speaking of books, uh, Jason Blair, one of our Patreon sponsors, uh, sent me a couple of his books that he has just written. They're now available through asa2fly.com. And on their website, they call these the Aviator Field Guides. And they say they're the first two books in a series. One is Middle Altitude Flying and the other is Tailwheel Flying. Now, I read Middle Altitude Flying while I was on an airliner recently. And it kind of struck me. I don't recall ever having seen a book about flying in the middle altitude. So I learned a few things there that I was not aware of. One, which seems kind of trivial. It had I, I do have a high altitude endorsement, but what I hadn't realized is that's not just required for flying above 25,000 feet. That's required no matter what altitude you're flying at, if you're in an airplane that's pressurized and can go above 25,000 feet. He also talked about uh, rich dieout, which I was not familiar with. Uh, rich dieout occurs when you have a uh, loss of a turbo at high altitude, and because the fuel flow is now too high for that normally aspirated engine, uh, it's going to basically basically die because it's uh, getting too much fuel going into there. So that he basically said that loss of turbo at an altitude seems like a failed engine uh, because the engine is being choked by the excessive amount of fuel. So a lot of interesting books. Take a look at those at asa2fly.com. <laughs> 
And I want to thank all of our listeners who came to the safety event that I organized at Moffett Field. It was held last week. We had about 200 people show up. About a quarter of the people raised their hands when I asked if they listened to the show. And I definitely want to thank our sponsors, AOPA, NASA, Cirrus, and Lightspeed, who all helped make the show possible. And thanks, too, to Garmin, who sent uh, Wayne McGee, who talked about ADSB. I had a number of different uh, topics there. I gave presentations on recent accidents. We also had NASA ASRS talking about uh, Uh, the reporting system, and let's see what else uh, AOPA presented on their collision course. And I met with uh, Patreon supporter Paris. He showed me his custom iPhone case with a print of SFO uh, terminal sectional chart on the back. And he said that uh, he ordered that through a vendor on Amazon.com. Print you a list, P-R-I-N-T-U-A list for $19, including shipping. He got the custom case for the iPhone 7. So thanks to everybody who came out to the show last week. It was great meeting you and hope to see you next year for Accident Wise 2019. And I had an email from Dan in Pennsylvania. He attended the long version of the AOPA Safety Seminar Collision Course Avoiding Airborne Traffic, which was presented at Moffitt. He said it was an excellent presentation that stressed the importance of keeping your eyes focused outside the cockpit for at least 80% of the time. This is probably not a surprise to any of us. However, in this day and age, when we have so many neat things to look at inside the cockpit, we need to keep reminding ourselves to keep an eye out for other aircraft, especially around airports. Please, Max, keep reminding us, your listeners, to pay attention to what is going on outside our plans and to put our head on a swivel when flying around airports. And he says, uh, thanks for the great podcast. And he mentions, P.S. Hackettstown is my favorite runway to practice hard surface landings. Well, that's where I used to uh, fly out of when I lived in northern New Jersey. So thanks so much, Dan, for your note. And I've been home now for about a week from bringing an SR-22 from Boston all the way back to California. We had good weather the entire way, though we did have an airmet for IFR over western Nebraska. Uh, Fortunately, we were able to fly over the top of those clouds, which was important as the temperatures were below freezing and we did not have a fiki capable aircraft, so we didn't want to pick up ice. I'll talk more about that trip next week when I interview the buyer of that SR-22 about our trip across the country. One thing I wanted to mention is I used a number of different apps, including AeroV, which was great for seeing what the cloud heights were going to be. But this trip, I couldn't send Pyreps through it, which I have been able to do in the past. And I exchanged some email with the company today. And what I discovered is that the uh, Wi-Fi may have been blocking my ability to send the Pyreps through the cellular. I thought I would mention this because this might be a problem you've encountered and didn't realize what was going on. Typically, when you use a cell phone, if Wi-Fi is on and you're trying to access data over the internet, the cell phone is going to try only to get that data through the Wi-Fi. And if you want to get data over your cellular data plan, you're going to have to turn off the Wi-Fi to do that. Well, I certainly understand how that works here in the house, but I hadn't realized that in the airplane, a similar phenomena would block me from using uh, cellular data. So it's possible since I was connected to an ADSB uh, device uh, using Wi-Fi that my access over the uh, cellular was now blocked. It turns out there is a solution for that, which I found on uh, Apple's uh, website today. And I'll go ahead and post this information uh, up on our Patreon site. But essentially what you end up doing is you connect your uh, cell phone uh, to your Wi-Fi device, then go into settings, select Wi-Fi, and then select the blue icon just to the right of the name of your uh, device that you're connecting to on Wi-Fi. Make a note of both the IP address and the subnet mask address, and then select the static option, and then just enter that IP address and the subnet mask address. Don't enter anything else, and then go ahead and save it. And then your phone will now be able to not only connect to the Wi-Fi device, but also to the LTE signal so that you can receive uh, data through your uh, cellular data plan. And I'll paste a link to that information on aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome, which is our Patreon page. And I mentioned earlier in the show that this past weekend I had yet another close encounter in the traffic pattern at a non-towered airport. So I thought I would tell you a little bit about that. I was flying the pattern with a student pilot in a Cirrus SR-20. We were on left downwind for runway 26. The winds happened to favor that runway at that time. And I was watching on our traffic system an aircraft that was getting closer to the airport and was initially maybe six, seven, eight hundred feet above us. But there was no call on the radio. So I was trying to guess 
who they were and exactly where they were because this was a TAS system, traffic awareness system, and it estimates position and distance just by the signal strength and using a diversity antenna. So the exact location, eh, it's a little, a little sketchy. It's never real precise, not as precise as the TIS traffic information that's uploaded by uh, FAA uh, ground radar stations. So I wasn't really sure exactly where this aircraft was or what their intentions were. I was guessing that perhaps they were inbound the uh, instrument approach to runway 26 and that they were just very late calling in on the CTAF frequency. Well, as we were getting down to the point where we were about to turn base, the aircraft was now only about 500 feet above us and it looked very close on the traffic system. And finally, about that time, uh, somebody called in, a pilot in an extra, and he said that he was on base, which I thought was kind of interesting because uh, we were just about to turn base. And he said that he had a, a sick passenger on board and needed to land immediately. Uh, so I said that uh, we can certainly extend our downwind for him to do that. And the next thing I know, he flew right in front of me from right to left. We were on downwind. He was on uh, a very high base uh, in front of me. And he had said that he had us in sight, but I was still kind of surprised when I saw him. After he landed, I said, you know, the FAA... Uh, says that pilots should be making calls 10 miles out when they're coming into a non-towered uh, airport, and your call was pretty late. And he said, well, yes, I know. I'm sorry. I had a sick passenger. And I kind of let him off the hook easily and said, well, that's okay. We were watching you on the traffic. No big deal. Yeah, I thought about it later, and I thought, you know, I think had I thought about it again, I probably would have said, Yes, that's probably true. And if you had hit us because you didn't uh, tell us you were coming in here, it probably would have been a lot worse than having just a sick passenger on board. So I'm just kind of reminded that just as the uh, two aircraft we talked about earlier hit at an intersection in Marion, Indiana, perhaps because one of them was not on the CTAF frequency, we need to follow the right procedures all the time, even when it doesn't seem like it's necessary. Just because you've got a sick passenger on board... <laughs> You know, you certainly have time to call in and let people know that yeah, you're going to be landing. Uh, so I don't really think that's a great excuse. Uh, I think that things would have been much worse if he had hit us uh, than if he had to clean up a little vomit from the back seat. So anyway, just my thoughts on that. And I want to let you know that my Raspberry Pi based live sectional map is coming along fine. I've got all the electronics working and now I'm just trying to figure out exactly what size sectional map to print so that I can install the lights in it to show the flight conditions that is uh, IFR, marginal VFR and so on at the different airports here in Northern California. Now I've had several people who listen to the show contact me and say that yes, they are building one as well too. Uh, in fact, one of them, Trevor Moody sent me a picture of his, he's completed it. It's hanging up there on the wall already. And a local fellow here, Ron Klutz, is uh, working on one. And he and I have been exchanging a lot of uh, email because uh, he and I both live in our fair city, Mountain View, California. So we're just uh, working on these things together. It's great fun. So if you have any interest in all building one of these things, there is a great detailed uh, description of how to put one together. And again, that's posted on the Patreon site as well. And speaking of Patreon, I'd like to thank our new Patreon supporters over the past week. And they are Ryan Blanding, Michael Gwynn, Piotr Polakowski, Stephen Bloom, Fabio Kamlos, Lance Fletcher, and Pete Shelters. And if you love the show, but you want just a little bit more, the Patreon site is the place to go. You'll find a lot of links posted up under the post, and many of the stories that I talk about on this show are posted up to a week in advance on the Patreon site. So look around, and if you decide you want to give a few dollars a month, that will automatically put you on the email list. And every time I post a story, you'll get an email, and you'll get probably a couple of those a week, maybe three, uh, telling you about new pieces of information that I've posted there. So just go to aviationnewstalk.com slash awesome. And since this is the first show of the month, that's when I read the names of all of our biggest supporters who contribute at least $20 a month. And those contributors are Jeremy Zawadny. He's a software developer. Peter Long, a pilot in Australia and former CFI here in Silicon Valley. Seth Lake. He's a military pilot and flight instructor in Arkansas. You can read about his podcast and flight school at gonogo.aero. Jason Blair, who's a DPE, that is a pilot examiner. He runs a blog at jasonblair.net. Joseph Haggerty II, he's a Mooney owner and pilot. Michael Rogers, Cirrus owner and pilot in Southern California. Michael Spain, student pilot in Oklahoma who's planning to buy a Cirrus. Larry Noe from New York City, he flies a Bonanza G36. 
Carl and Ann Rossi of Maine Cooncat Aviation LLC, and they fly three Cessna T240 aircraft. Roger Griggs, he's a turbine guy. He flies a TBM 850 in the past, and he's now got a new Meridian 600. Troy Wisman, he's an IT guy in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. He flies a Turbo 182RG, and you can read about his plane and his charitable flying at Wistman, W-H-I-S-T-M-A-N dot com. Chuck Price, we interviewed him a while back. He is an engineering manager at Too Simple, T-U-S-I-M-P-L-E dot A-I. And you can read about the trucks that they are running using artificial intelligence. Don Dillman, he's a professional pilot who runs a training center for a very large company. He owns a Bonanza F-33A and just reinstated his CFI, so welcome back to the fold. Stella Sue, she's a student pilot in the SR-20 that I've been teaching, and we recently streamed a live flight lesson for her on Facebook Live, and you can find that on the Patreon site. Jonathan Weisswasser, he's a vascular surgeon, also a ham radio, as am I, and he flies a Meridian. Jim Barath, he runs Sonix ESD, which is located here in Northern California, specializes in active noise control, and he's also a Cirrus SR-22 owner. And our newest member of the group, Lance Fletcher. He's a former crew chief in the Air Force on the F-111F. He says that he always wanted to learn to fly for decades, and he has now just taken the plunge. So, Lance, welcome to the Flying Club. So, I want to thank all of you for your contributions, and thank everyone who helps support the show in any way. And now stick around, because we'll be back in seven seconds talking about some recent fatal accidents. Yeah, welcome back. I thought I would share some data from a presentation that I gave at Accident Wise 2018 last week at Moffett Field. And ostensibly, it's about San Francisco Bay Area accidents, but actually, it's a much broader story that applies to folks just about anywhere, which is why I thought you might be interested in it. You know, the first question I ask people is why do we read about accidents? And, you know, the main reason is so that we can learn from them and try and avoid making the same mistakes that other people have made. The good news is pilots are not inventing new ways to kill themselves in airplanes, which means if you know a lot about them, then you're going to reduce the odds of yourself uh, becoming in one of those accidents. Of course, the bad news is pilots are still not inventing new ways to kill themselves in airplanes and continue to crash anyway. And I think the benefit of reading about accidents is it really can empower people to help uh, take control of their flying so that they avoid essentially 80% of all the accidents, because about 80% of accidents are the result of pilot error. So if you can just avoid consistently making errors, you've greatly increased your safety record when you fly. Now, another thing to ask is, are accidents the same everywhere in the country? And you might think they are. You look at some of the uh, reports, such as the AOPA NAL report, which is excellent, by the way. It comes out every year. Good source of information on accidents here in the United States. And yet, since they aggregate all the data from all 50 states, it tends to mask regional differences. So if accidents theoretically are different in Colorado than they are from Florida, well, <laughs> you're not going to find that out because they're all going to be averaged out together. And I would have to uh, you know, submit that accidents are different uh, in different areas of the country. Uh, and so it's important to understand the regional differences. Also, you have to ask yourself, do good pilots have accidents? And <laughs> sadly, the answer is yes. Uh, I don't know if you've been to any pilot funerals. I've been to way too many of them over the years. And one of the things you always hear people say is, oh, he or she was such a good pilot. And most of the time, that's actually true. Uh, and I think what's also true is that in many of these cases, they made one or more decisions that were suboptimal that ultimately led to an accident. So I think as pilots, we need to consistently make good decisions every single time we go flying. doesn't matter whether you've got 10,000 hours and an ATP. Yeah, all that is irrelevant to today's flight. Now, I was prompted to start researching local accidents when a former FAA inspector uh, here in the San Francisco Bay Area made a comment that just really struck me as odd and got my curiosity going. It was Jack Hawker back in 2003, and he said in a presentation, my job is easy because our local airmen are thoughtful enough to crash in other districts. <laughs> I thought, well, that's kind of odd. <laughs> Why would people, you know, fly out of the San Jose FISDO to have their uh, the accident? So that prompted me to research 10 years of uh, San Francisco Bay Area fatal accident history, and I wanted to know just where are they crashing, uh, what kinds of accidents were occurring, and did they somehow differ from the national statistics? 
And so first, just to, for the folks who are not familiar with Northern California here, let me tell you a little bit about some of the differences. We have excellent uh, weather here in general. Uh, I would say we can fly VFR about 97% of the time. Uh, the weather is really that good. On the other hand, we have a large number of microclimates. You can you know, move 10 miles and the weather is going to be totally different. And we probably have, oh, I would imagine at least a dozen of these microclimates uh, within the greater San Francisco Bay Area. Most evenings, we have a layer of clouds that moves in uh, low-level stratus, perhaps a 1,000 feet, uh, sometimes lower from the ocean, and then it burns off uh, in the early morning. Uh, and so we often have IFR conditions. But we also have a lot of mountains here uh, in the Bay Area. So that mix of uh, clouds and mountains is pretty dangerous. We have mostly sea-level airports and pretty moderate temperatures. So we don't have many density altitude issues locally. Of course, pilots who then fly up to Tahoe from here are not familiar with density altitude and get themselves in trouble when they are there. We've got really excellent radar coverage uh, pretty much everywhere in the Bay Area, which is a big help. Now, here's another thing that uh, is incredibly helpful. We have excellent airline service out of three different airports in the metro area here to just about every uh, location in the U.S. Uh, very few connections required. You can get a direct flight almost anywhere. And the benefit of that is that as a GA pilot, you don't have to continue on in bad weather. You can land, and if you have to be back home on Monday, just grab a, a flight uh, and you know fly back into Oakland or San Francisco or San Jose. So I think that gives pilots many alternatives where they don't feel that they have to, you know, continue to fly in the adverse conditions. I mentioned that we've got uh, mountains here. The highest uh, elevation locally is uh, 4,400 feet. That's uh, Mount Hamilton, but we've got ridges and hills and mountains uh, everywhere. Of course, if you go further south of Monterey, the mountains get higher. Uh, north of Petaluma and Santa Rosa, they also get higher. It is very congested and complex airspace here. So your odds of getting a, uh, a violation for Class B uh, are certainly higher than they would be in some other uh, areas. So what I did is I analyzed uh, San Francisco Bay Area accidents, but I didn't want to look at accidents that just crashed locally. I wanted to find all fatal accidents for aircraft that were en route to or from a Bay Area airport, which meant I had to look out of state to find many of these accidents. And then basically what I did is I looked at a 13-year period that yielded about 100 uh, fatal accidents uh, within the area. And so to define the Bay Area, I essentially looked at airports that were anywhere from Petaluma to the north, all the way down to Watsonville to the south, east of the Altamont Pass, which is near Tracy and Byron. And this produced a uh, 6,700 square mile area, about 122 miles long by about 55 miles wide, which I would consider the, the general Bay Area. Now, what's interesting is most of the night and weather fatal accidents that originated in this area all occurred in a much, much, much smaller area that was 22 miles long, 22 miles wide. Uh, just 7% of the total area had most of the night and weather fatal accidents, and that was the Livermore Valley. I kind of joked in the presentation last week, I asked them, what's the name of that? People said Livermore Valley. And I said, no, it's Death Valley. Of course, that was the name of a TV show many, many years ago. And it's also a section in uh, Southern California. So I think pilots need to be aware of that. Anytime they're flying the Livermore Valley, that valley is completely ringed by mountains on all four sides. And it's easy to get in trouble there when the, the weather moves in. So essentially what I did is I looked at all the Fatal Bay uh, area accidents from that area, found uh, the probable cause uh, reports from uh, the uh, NTSB. Then I compared the accident factors with uh, one of the null reports from AOPA, tried to identify the differences and also plot accident locations and look for patterns. The key findings out of that was that uh, for that period of time, 50% of the fatal accidents occurred at night. Now, what's stunning is that uh, the null report at that time said that only 21% of fatal accidents occurred uh, at night in the United States. So that meant the San Francisco Bay Area had a night accident rate two and a half times higher than the rest of the country. And about 30% of all these accidents were VFR into IMC. Not surprising, given all the low clouds that I just mentioned before. If you compare that nationally, only about 5% of all fatal accidents were VFR to IMC. Now, most of these crashes were on longer trips and they occurred in mountainous area. And as I mentioned before, most of the night and weather accidents occurred in the Livermore Valley. So one of the key findings, other than the higher rate of night accidents and VFR into IMC accidents, was that we did have clusters, which was the Livermore Valley, and that longer trips definitely increased the risk of a fatal accident. I looked at accidents that were outside of California going into the Bay Area, and of those 100 accidents, it looks like about eight of them uh, were out of state. Uh, so we had them up in Washington State, Oregon, 
uh, let's see, Nevada and New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. Every one of these out-of-state accidents, by the way, occurred either at night or was weather-related. And so you might want to ask yourself, why are uh, long trips more likely to uh, result in a fatal accident? And having made a lot of those recently, I can tell you fatigue is a big issue. Unfamiliarity with the area is another big issue. Also, of course, you are crossing multiple weather systems as you are traveling a long distance. And of course, hunger, I think, uh, sometimes dehydration and also hypoxia, because often you're traveling at higher altitudes. On my last trip coming back from Boston, we were at 10,504 hours as we were coming across uh, Wyoming and Utah. Uh, I did a plot of all the accidents uh, going to and from the Bay Area that occurred in California. And when you look at the map, it's really fascinating. Virtually every one of those accidents occurred in a mountainous area. Uh, very few of them occurred in the flatlands. So the mountains are definitely uh, you know, a major factor uh, in all these accidents. Well, I went ahead and updated uh, this report for the next 10-year period. So the initial uh, period looked at from about 1995 to about 2005. From 2005 to 2015, the night accident rate had dropped. It was now only 27% of all fatal accidents in the Bay Area occurred at night versus what's now 17% uh, in the rest of the country, according to the 2010 null report. Our VFR into IMC also decreased about 15% of the total, uh, where VFR into IMC versus about 4% uh, nationwide. We also had a number of controlled flight into terrain, uh, weather-related, and loss of control accidents were about 33% of the total. So in general, if we look at accidents here in the San Francisco Bay Area, I think common threads are long trips, uh, weather, night, and also loss of control, which is the number one cause of accidents here in the United States. And we talked about that in episode 43 when we talked about distractions, which are, according to the NTSB, one of the major cause of loss of control accidents. Okay, looking now at some of the fatal accidents that occurred in the last two years in this area, a number of them were out of state. Here's one that occurred in Oregon, Brookings, Oregon, which is right along the coast. Occurred on July 4th, 2016 at 11 p.m. at night. Folks, that's pretty late to be uh, taking off and going flying, which is what this pilot was doing. It was a Cessna 172. The flight originated in Hollister, California, which is in the San Francisco Bay Area within that large rectangle that I described earlier from which the air accident airports were selected. And this was the third leg of the day. So you can imagine the pilot was relatively tired. It was in dark night conditions. And by the way, 90% of night accidents occur in what's called dark night conditions. And that would be where you have no moon or in which the moon is obscured by an overlayer of uh, an overcast of clouds. Uh, so you want to be particularly aware of uh, flying off when it's totally dark. That's frankly almost the same as flying uh, IFR. So you want to be very careful of uh, doing that, especially as a private pilot. Now, in this particular case, this was a non-IFR pilot. Uh, he had 207 hours of total time, third leg of the day, so he had to be tired. He, after takeoff, crashed two miles west of the airport shortly after takeoff. Now, this is a classic dark night accident. A probable cause says the pilot's spatial disorientation, which means he couldn't tell where the horizon was and therefore couldn't keep the wings level with the horizon. The pilot's spatial disorientation and loss of situational awareness during the departure in dark night conditions, which resulted in an in-flight collision with the water because Brookings is right next to the water. Imagine how black it is out over the water uh, at night. I've experienced this. I can tell you it's incredibly disorienting to, to fly over uh, black water uh, at night. And you can get these conditions anywhere. Uh, for example, if you're flying over uh, mountains or land where there's few lights on the ground, you'll get these same uh, conditions where you can get spatial disorientation. I'm guessing with 207 hours, you probably didn't have a lot of night flying experience. And folks, I know that as a private pilot, you get three hours of night training. That is not enough to keep you safe if you're going to be flying in dark night conditions. Hopefully, you'll have an autopilot or something else to help you in those circumstances. Another out-of-state flight occurred in Madras, Oregon. This was on August 19th, 2017, and that was the day of the solar eclipse. This was an experimental aircraft, a Wheeler Express, which departed from San Carlos Airport here in the Bay Area. As he arrived at Madras Airport in Oregon, he was told to proceed to a three-mile final. He reported that he was on a three-mile left base, but then he suddenly crashed to 1.1 miles from the threshold, right on a cliff that uh, leads up to the runway. 
Now, this is just a preliminary report, so there is no probable cause uh, at this point in time, but it certainly looks like a loss of control accident. So hard to know whether if he was just in a turn from base to final and somehow got slow or whether this uh, cliff uh, was disorienting to him. Uh, so you can see from the photo here that there's drop off of probably hundreds of feet uh, right at the threshold of the other uh, runway. So that can be uh, disorienting. Another crash occurred in Santa Rosa. This was a PA-24-260, a Piper Comanche, January of 2016 at about 7 p.m., so that would have been night as well. Long flight as well, Palm Springs, which is in Southern California, to Santa Rosa. This pilot was more experienced. He had 1,200 total flight hours, was an instrument-rated pilot. His trip was VFR the entire way, except 46 miles from Santa Rosa, he did a pop-up IFR clearance, so he must have realized there was uh, weather at his destination. As he proceeded on his instrument approach into Santa Rosa, he reported that he had missed intercepting the localizer, and uh, radar subsequently showed that he crossed the final approach fix, which would have been four to five miles from the runway, a thousand feet above the glide slope intercept altitude. Well, if you're going to be a thousand feet high on an instrument approach and you're going to continue the approach, the only thing you can do is increase the descent rate and hopefully also pull the power way back to slow down the aircraft. And sure enough, uh, it shows that his descent rate went from 600 feet per minute, which would be pretty standard on an instrument approach, to about 1,200 feet per minute. Problem with that is when you have these uh, unstable high descent rates, uh, it's easy to lose control and perhaps continue to uh, uh, descend into the ground. The tower notified that the pilot, he was well right of course, and that was the, the last transmission. The probable cause, failure to maintain airplane control during an instrument approach in night IMC conditions. They also cited a lack of recent experience in night. So everything gets tougher at night, including flying instrument approaches. Here's an interesting accident. I remember when it occurred at uh, Moss Beach, which is right next to Half Moon Bay, California, back in November of 2016. Daytime VMC, 1115 in the morning. This was on a trip from a, a Sacramento to Half Moon Bay. So that's probably an hour flight or maybe slightly longer than 172. This pilot had uh, 1140 hours of total time. Uh, 10 hours in the last uh, 30 days, which tells us that this pilot was relatively current and had been out flying recently. Now, this one was really interesting, and I never actually heard the probable cause until I did the research uh, just a few days ago on this. At the time of the accident, there was a 70-degree right crosswind at 10 knots with gusts to 14 knots. Now, you might say, okay, that's a little strong of a crosswind, uh, especially for a 172, uh, but certainly doable with a competent pilot. So what was the problem? Well, it turned out uh, it was more than just a crosswind. The probable cause said the pilot's loss of airplane control followed an encounter with low-level wind shear and turbulence during final approach for landing. Contributing to the loss of control was the pilot's decision to retract the wing flaps on final approach, which resulted in a sudden loss of lift. Well, there's a little bit more to the story as well. The weather at the time indicated that there was a temperature inversion at about 600 feet. Uh, and so the temperatures, instead of decreasing as you uh, went higher, uh, increased. And what this tends to do is uh, trap the winds below the inversion layer. Now, Half Moon Bay Airport is right next to a mountain that goes up, I would say, 2,500 feet. And so this trapped the wind gusts coming off this mountain very low level. Uh, and that's what apparently contributed to the wind shear that was experienced at the airport. So very interesting uh, accident. Unfortunately, fatal as were all of these. Here's another accident that occurred in Bolinas, California. That's right on the coastline north of uh, San Francisco, September 7th, 2017, 2 p.m., day VMC. This was a trip from Santa Inez to Santa Rosa. That's going to be a couple hours uh, in a Cessna 172. And this was a private pilot, but he had just received his license a few weeks ago. Not only that, he was from Houston and he was visiting his home in Santa Barbara, decided to rent an aircraft to fly in business to Northern California. At the time of the accident, the report says a fog layer was present over the Point Reyes National Park that encompassed the accident site, which was up against the side of a hill. So again, just preliminary report, don't know exactly what happened, but some common themes here, long trip, weather, and of course also a low time pilot as well. And we have some of those same themes in this next report, which comes from just a month ago, Petaluma, California, April the 6th, the Mooney M20J crashed shortly after takeoff. It was indeed a long trip. The pilot was headed to San Diego, which would be a couple of hours in the Mooney. Uh, there was weather, in fact, uh, significant weather. There had been storms all throughout the Bay Area uh, that day. 
and the clouds were overcast, 600 feet AGL. Visibility at the time was reported as three quarters of a mile, which to me suggests the pilot wouldn't have been able to get back into his departure airport if he encountered a problem. By the way, that's one of my personal minimums. I don't take off in weather that's so bad that it's a, uh, below the minimums required to get back into that airport. It's kind of silly to have to go uh, you know, find good weather elsewhere uh, if you have some type of an emergency. This pilot was fairly experienced, 75 years old, instrument rated, was a member of the Civil Air Patrol, and he was also a Vietnam uh, veteran, uh, had been in the Marine Corps for 20 years. According to the preliminary accident report, he crashed less than two miles from the departure airport, so that would have been very soon after takeoff, impacted in a near vertical attitude in a soft, muddy uh, field elevation of 307 feet. So this definitely sounds like a loss of control uh, issue. And of course, it may also have to do with uh, weather. I don't recall that there was convective activity on that day, but certainly uh, it was extremely uh, stormy, pretty bad weather for around here. Now, this next accident is one uh, that just, I think, is confounding. Sometimes you get accidents where you just kind of wonder what the heck happened. And, and of course, sometimes we just never find out for sure. But this occurred in January 29th, uh, 2018, so earlier this year. It was a Cessna 152 that crashed after taking off from Concord, California, crashed about uh, five miles away. It was a VFR flight. Uh, conditions were reasonably good. Calm winds, visibility five miles and mist. So there might be something right there. I mean, there might have been a little bit of fog. Clear skies, temperature 11, dew point nine. So those two are pretty close together, which uh, suggests possible low clouds or fog. Uh, it was an ATP rated pilot. Uh, and so it's kind of confounding that we would have someone who's got the highest uh, certificate who has crashed one of the most basic you know, training aircraft. Uh, it does appear to be some type of loss of control, um, but uh, it's <laughs> it's pretty easy in general around here to avoid the mist and the the clouds. So you got to wonder if perhaps he got distracted. Uh, you know, distractions are, according to the NTSB, one of the leading causes of uh, loss of control accidents. It's pretty easy to start uh, you know, looking at something down inside the cabin, not be looking outside, and before you know it, uh, you're no longer uh, you know flying straight and level. So look forward to finding out more. About this accident because it's certainly confounding. It's just a preliminary report, so we have no probable cause yet issued for it. This next accident happened in the same general area under similar kinds of conditions. Now, this was an aircraft that departed Concord, was going on a longer trip headed to the Arcata Eureka Airport, which is way up on the California-Oregon border. It was a Beach G36. Now, that's a Beach Bonanza with a Garmin G1000. So that's an incredibly capable aircraft with one of the most modern avionics suites uh, that you can buy. Uh, so that would include things like uh, traffic information, terrain information. You know, anybody with a G1000 should never be flying into terrain because that data is uh, readily available to you. Also, VFR VMC conditions. Uh, it was a 67-year-old pilot with his 43-year-old son. Uh, both uh, died. The crash was at Benicia, uh, just a few miles away from uh, Concord. So again, quite confounding. It sounds like uh, some type of loss of control, but again, it's hard to understand uh, you know, how this would happen with such a capable aircraft. Now, we don't know much about the pilot, and that might be uh, you know something that comes out later. This next accident occurred down in Marina, California. That's down next to the uh, Monterey Bay, just north of Monterey. A Mooney M20E occurred uh, earlier this year, March 26th in 2018, 10.53 a.m. in the morning, daytime VFR. This was a private pilot who was instrument rated with a total of 2,600 hours, so pretty high time. Now, here's what's unusual about it. Witnesses all reported, this comes directly from the NTSB report, witnesses all reported that they observed the airplane begin an unusually steep climb in an unusually high nose-up attitude. The airplane then pitched over to an approximately level attitude and then began to yaw to the left. As it did so, the nose and left wing dropped. So it sounds like some type of uh, either, you know, badly mistrimmed aircraft or uh, you know, some type of weight and balance problem or a pilot who was really distracted and allowed the aircraft to, you know, pitch up way too high and uh, become too slow. All of which sound pretty unusual for a high time uh, pilot. So again, sometimes you read about these accidents and you really can't figure out how the heck did that happen. Again, it's just preliminary report. So hopefully the probable cause report will uh, you know bring out some more information about that. 
Now, here's an accident that I talked about at the seminar that was not recent, but it always just tugs at my heart. Uh, I included this in an earlier presentation two years ago at Moffett Field. This occurred in July 7th, 2011. 7.28 p.m., so in the evening, but still probably d daytime uh, in the summertime. It was a Mooney departing from Watsonville, California. Now, Watsonville is right on the coast, and what's pretty typical there is that every evening the marine layer, that low level of stratus clouds, moves in from the ocean, which is all of four miles away from the airport. Now, this private pilot had a total of 152 hours 140 hours of which were in the make and model. So apparently he did a lot of his student pilot flying in the Mooney, uh, but still a low time guy, 152 hours. He departed runway 20 toward the cloud layer that was at the end of the runway. So the runway probably uh, is about 4,000 feet long, and it sounds like the clouds were somewhere coming up on the 02 numbers, which means partway down the runway, he was going to be uh, having to turn to avoid the clouds. It says that while turning to avoid clouds, he stalled and spun in. Now, here's something that the NTSB noted. They said that any of the other three runways uh, would have avoided the clouds uh, that were there at that airport. And they say that, quote, runway choice may have been influenced by habit or existing traffic. Well, the winds at the time were 190 at six knots, so they definitely favored runway 20 as they usually do. But I totally get what they mean about habit. Every time I go into Watsonville, I'm almost always landing runway 20. I think the locals get in the habit of always using runway 20. The other runways almost never get used. And what's really sad about this is I think that this pilot and probably many pilots don't realize that there are times when it may make sense to take off with a tailwind or to land with a tailwind. A six knot tailwind is not going to greatly increase the uh, takeoff distance uh, for aircraft like uh, Cirrus. Uh, you're going to add 10% for every two knots. So that means it would be 30% longer takeoff distance. Not only that, if he had taken off runway 02, he would have been taking off downhill, which would also have gotten him off the, the ground sooner. So this low time pilot had many choices, none of which probably were ever explained to him as part of his pilot training. What's most sad about this was there was a family of four on board. Everybody was killed. So please keep in mind, there may be times when it does make sense to land or take off with a tailwind. So calculate what the numbers are and and consider doing that when it makes sense. Well, just in summary, we have a lot of accidents that kind of fall into the categories of long trips, uh, weather, nighttime, and loss of control. So if you want to enhance your safety, one thing to do, uh, stay in the traffic pattern. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> On longer trips, you want to do a lot of extra planning uh, and make sure that perhaps that you get some uh, co consultation ahead of time from a CFI and that you're as familiar as you can uh, with the trip. Weather kind of goes without saying, try and stay out of the weather. Night, you know, years ago I gave uh, a seminar many, many times about night flying. And years later, someone came up to me and said, Max, you know, after taking your seminar, I stopped flying at night. <laughs> I said, well, that wasn't the quite the message I was trying to convey. And I said, no, but what I hadn't realized was the extra risk that I fa faced when flying at night. But what I realized is by just carefully scheduling my time, I could avoid flying at night. So he just flies in the daytime by uh, adjusting his schedule. And of course, loss of control accidents also a common theme here. You want to make sure that you don't get distracted when you're in the airplane. Well, coming up next, lots of listener feedback and questions. We have one from an intern who asks, what are the biggest issues with modern avionics systems? We'll be right back. Yeah, welcome back, and we'll get to feedback and questions in just a second. But first, a big thank you to everybody who left reviews in the Apple Podcast app, which was formerly called iTunes. Uh, Harley Miskov, Benoit C, Flying 64Q, all left reviews. Thanks so much. Uh, let's see. Harley really loves the uh, the show. Uh, Benoit thinks it's a good show, but he has one criticism. Benoit, send me an email. I'll try to explain this uh, to your satisfaction. Flying 64Q says, can you do podcasts on weather planning and long cross-country flight planning? Well, guess what? You're going to enjoy the show next week. And then in our dedicated Aviation News Talk app, which can now be found both in the Apple App Store and in the Google Play Store, it's a dedicated app. Uh, T. Alexander Mashad and uh, D76554 uh, both left reviews. And let's see, the latter one from D76554, he said at the end, I also want to compliment Max for not covering topics like A380 sales forecast in Asia and many topics for those training for jobs at the major airlines. There are podcasts for that. Yes, you're absolutely right. That's what I was always trying to do 
is create something that is for those of us who are involved in general aviation, because uh, you can find other podcasts that talk about the airlines or military aviation and things like that. So I'm glad that uh, you like how we've chosen to tailor our content on the show here strictly to general aviation. Now let's take a look at some listener feedback. This email comes from Jeremy, who's one of our Patreon sponsors. He said, I had an experience earlier today. My wife and I were recently flying back from Grand Junction, Colorado, in our Bonanza when at 14,500 feet, right around Richfield, Utah, we lost GPS on both our Garmin GTN 750 and the GTN 650. I thought that was odd and expected it to return, but it didn't. I double-checked the VOR that was tuned. After about five minutes of being no GPS, I decided to tell Salt Lake Center that we'd lost GPS and ask if anyone else had reported issues in the area. To my surprise, they said it was the first they'd heard, and they told us to let them know if we needed any assistance. While I was thinking about how long our plane might end up spending at the avionics shops, in the next 60 seconds, no fewer than four airliners on frequency also confessed that they had lost GPS some time ago. After that happened, Salt Lake Center checked the notums and started informing pilots as they came on frequency that GPS jamming was in effect and offered navigational help. Our outage lasted probably 20 to 25 minutes, and we were traveling at 190 knots across the ground, so it affected a sizable area. Two things about this event stood out to me. First, all the airliners flying up in the flight levels are on IFR flight plans by definition. I was taught that it's required to report to ATC any loss of navigation facilities, including GPS anomalies, and he cites uh, the AIM-533. Also, were the airliners somehow exempt from this? Possibly because there was a notum about the testing. Maybe they're using older RNAV systems and have GPS as a supplemental system. Second, it was abundantly obvious that ATC doesn't know when the military flips the switch on or off for jamming activities. They also don't know what sort of area will really be affected or how long it will last. Several of us provided reports when the GPS signal became usable again. Keeping those old VOR skills alive is definitely handy for situations like this, as is being on flight following. The controllers seem more than happy to confirm positions. We heard a few of those and provided vectors as needed. Well, Jeremy, thanks so much for your comment, and I totally agree with you. I think the airlines probably were remiss in not reporting the outages as soon as they noted them. I don't believe there are any exemption from airliners from this particular rule to report when you're IFR that you have any equipment failure at all. And even if the GPS systems aboard the airliners were supplemental systems, the rules are not different for supplemental systems. And by the way, some examiners might ask someone, what if your old ADF receiver in the panel dies? Do you have to report that when you're IFR? The answer is yes, and the reasoning is that you really don't know what plans ATC might have for you toward the end of your trip and what type of equipment might be required. So the rules say that any equipment outage must be reported when you're IFR. Jeremy, thanks so much for sharing this story. Hey Max, I have a specific question concerning motion sickness during flying. I had a discovery flight this weekend and it was a great experience. But uh, around the middle of the flight, flying time, I felt quite bad and I didn't have to throw up, but it was quite close, I have to say. So uh, there's a lot of different opinions on the web concerning this issue, starting from you get used to it or eat this, don't eat that. And of course, some people will never get used to it, I guess. Do you have any uh, advice or any experiences concerning this uh, that might be helpful? Thanks uh, for the podcast. Always a pleasure to listen. Greetings from Germany. Hello, Marcus. Uh, danke für Ihre Frage. Thanks so much for your question from Deutschland. I have not read anything specifically on the web about this, but I can tell you what my experiences have been. Years ago, I had a student come to me, and by the way, it's a relatively small percentage of the people that I encounter in flight training. I mean, literally only a couple percent uh, who have faced this as an issue. And for this particular gentleman, he was uh, you know, very queasy on his first flight, and that continued, I guess, on the second flight. So I suggested to him that he take perhaps half of a Dramamine, uh, so an anti-motion sickness type of uh, over-the-counter uh, medicine. And he took that probably for six or seven of our flights. And then he stopped taking it and he was absolutely fine. So I don't know if the Dramamine is what helped him. I 
think it was, frankly, because he was much more comfortable on the on the third flight. And I think that then gave him time to get uh, used to what the feelings were like. And he did just fine as he continued on for his flight training. And I just want to emphasize that that certainly worked out because he was a student pilot. He had me in the aircraft. I was the pilot in command. I would absolutely not recommend that as a strategy for someone who is soloing, for someone who is a licensed pilot. I don't believe that uh, you'd be allowed to take that medication. But as a transition uh, way to help someone get adjusted while they're still under the uh, you know care of a flight instructor, I think that's a reasonable way to go. I have one other person who came to me almost 10 years ago, and he almost, I think he did actually throw up uh, on the flight just moments after we uh, took off. He came back again uh, this year, and I hadn't realized who it was, but we flew uh, probably for 45 minutes before he told me he was starting to feel uh, you know queasy again. And so somehow, I don't know if the 10 years as he got older uh, just made it a little bit easier for him to uh, to deal with that. I gave him the same suggestions about the drama mean, but I have not seen him come back. Uh, I agree that uh, probably not having a full stomach can be very helpful. Years ago, I used to scuba dive, and I found that in uh, the Caribbean where we were diving, when the small boat was rocking dramatically, that uh, <laughs> if I'd had breakfast, it wasn't going to stay with me for long. But if I didn't have breakfast, I felt a heck of a lot better. So, Marcus, I hope uh, those tips help for you, and I hope you go forward with flight training. And here's a question that came in from Jaden. Jaden, sorry, I haven't gotten to this sooner. I wasn't quite sure how to address this, but I finally figured out what we're going to do. We're going to crowdsource the answer to your question. So let's consider this the question of the month. And I'm going to ask listeners to record audio and give their feedback to you. And we'll put that together in an episode at the end of this month, at the end of May. So at the end, I'll give you some details on how to do with it. But here's Jaden's question. He says, hey, Max, I've been listening to your Aviation News Talk podcast for about two months now. And I would like to ask for some help in advice regarding GA avionics. I am currently a junior in aerospace engineering. Yay, engineering rocks. Uh, That's my comment, of course, here at the University of Kansas. And I've been hired by Garmin to work as an aviation systems engineer intern this summer. So lately, I've been trying to learn as much as I can about general aviation avionics and the G1000, G2000, and G3000 systems. Do you have any tips for getting up to speed with what's going on currently in the GA industry? Your podcast has been a great resource, but I'm looking for other ways to improve my GA knowledge base. As a pilot, what has been your biggest issue with modern avionics systems? Are there specific features you feel that they lack? Also, what future avionics technologies are you most excited about? I'm a fan of your podcast. It's very informative. You're a great host. Thank you for all the time you put into making content for people in the GA community. Thanks again from Jaden. Well, Jaden, I'm going to go ahead and ask our listeners to specifically address one of your questions. I'll briefly address a couple of other things uh, regarding the G1000. Well, there's an extremely well-written book on the topic. Uh, Max Truscott's G1000 Glass Cockpit Handbook. Uh, We had a lot of excellent feedback on that. So you might want to read through that and that will uh, probably bring you up to speed pretty fast on the Garmin G1000. Sorry, I don't have books on the G2000 and the G3000. In terms of uh, what's going on currently in the GA industry, boy, I would look to, for example, uh, AOPA.org's website, EAA.org, the major alphabet organizations, and also uh, MBAA, the National Business Aircraft Association. That'll probably give you a good representative sample of what's uh, going on uh, just by reading the news releases uh, from uh, these organizations. And of course, the, uh, the big thing that's been going on has been ATC privatization as we've talked about uh, earlier. So here's what I'm going to ask listeners to crowdsource for us. Please answer the question, what has been your biggest issue with modern avionics systems? And are there specific features you feel that they lack? And also, what future avionics technologies are you most excited about? These, I would like to ask, be recordings, and I'd like you to send them to me by the end of the day on May 25th. And there are a couple of ways you can do that. I would suggest if you have an iPhone, just search for the app called Voice Memos. That's going to be on your phone. It might be in a folder somewhere. So just search on the phone for Voice Memos, and you can then record directly using your phone. Then send it to me as an email. And if you would, please put the words intern audio in the subject line. That'll make it much, much easier for me to find these among the many emails that I get. And send that to me before the end of the day on May 25th. And of course, if you have some other type of phone, an Android perhaps, or even the Windows phone, uh, there's probably some app on there that allows you to record voice memos. Just look for that. And when you email it, go ahead and send it to my uh, info at sjflight.com address. That's short for San Jose Flight. So info at 
Sierra Juliet Flight, sjflight.com. Sorry, I don't have an email set up here for aviationnewstalk.com, uh, but that will definitely get it to me. Or you can just go out to aviationnewstalk.com, click on listener questions, and on that page you will find a link to SpeakPipe where you can once again record either from your phone or from your uh, home computer, if you have a microphone, a short answer to Jaden's question. And I would say keep it under, you know, a minute to a minute and a half at the very most. Just start by giving us your name and where you're located, uh, you know, first name and what state you're in or what country you're in. And then go ahead and answer the questions. What are your biggest issues with modern avionics? Are there specific features you feel they lack? And what future avionics technologies are you most excited about that? We'll put that into a show in the last show of the month for May and give uh, Jaden a crowdsourced uh, answer to his question. And with that, let me encourage you to listen to bloopers at the end of the show. But also, if you have a question you'd like to answer it on a future show, just click on the artwork in your podcast player and you'll find my contact information and a link where you can go to record a question from your smartphone or to record an answer to Jaden's question. Also, please take a moment to think of one or two of your friends who you think might enjoy this show. Then later on, contact them and tell them about the show. This, frankly, is the way most people find our podcast is because someone like you took just a moment to tell someone else about the show. And if that person is not familiar with what a podcast is, well, just send them out to the Apple App Store where they can download our dedicated Aviation News Talk podcast app or the Google Play Store where we now have an Android version available of the app as well. And if you think that someday you might buy a new or slightly used Cirrus, please contact me today so I can help arrange a free demo flight for you if you're considering a new Cirrus and help you understand the many factors, not all of which are obvious, in buying a new versus a slightly used Cirrus. I specialize in Cirrus and work with people literally around the world. Until next time, fly safely, have fun, and keep the blue side up. From avweb.com, Southwest. From avweb.com, Southwest accident brings pipe. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. Also, there were major. Also, there were multiple major announcements at the Aero Expo 2018 show in Friedrichshafen. Also, there were major multiple announcements at the Aero Expo 2018 show in Friedrichshafen, Germany last week that we'll talk. In Fried, Friedrich. In Friedrichshafen, in Friedrichshafen, Germany. Oh.